Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the November meeting of the Planning Committee. Are there any apologies for absence, please? From Mr. Geen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, does any member have any declarations of interest or lobbying or unaccompanied site visits that they wish to declare? No, thank you very much. Minutes. Uh, Three one to approve as correct record the minutes of the meeting of the planning committee held on the third of September. May I take them as a true record, please? Proposed, <coughs> seconded. May I see all those in favour? Uh, any against? Any abstentions? You just were raising your hand. No, no, mistake. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and any matters arising from page one, page two. <coughs> Page three. No, thank you. Uh, we have not been advised of any member of the public wishing to speak to any item today. Item five, appeal decision. Uh, quite an interesting one, this one. Um, so, Mr. White, would you like to walk us through the um, appeal inspector's decision, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, the appeal site uh, is uh, adjacent to a property called Big Goods, which is at Bury. Um, it was a, an application that came for committee. I'll put the slide up just because that may, may help with the memory. Um, it was refused at committee in November 2023. Um, obviously, the appeal followed that. The inspectors have been out and had a look, and they've determined that the appeal should be allowed. So they've granted planning permission. You'll see from the decision they've picked up on two main issues. Uh, one was related to the functional need for the building. The second then was the impact of that building on the character and appearance of the area. <coughs> the inspectors looked at both of those main issues. In terms of functional need, they, have, they are satisfied, or they were satisfied, the, the land required regular maintenance. It was only about a third of a hectare, um, but they felt that the equipment on, on the land uh, was necessary for horticultural purposes and that equated to a need, a reasonable need for the building. So they were satisfied of the need for the building. There were some questions over whether they could have used some of the existing buildings of which there was a fair number within the garden and the property itself. The inspector looked at those and actually felt for reasons related to sort of uh, changes in level that they weren't really practical for the equipment that needed to be stored. So they were, in the end, satisfied there was a functional need. They then looked at the impact of that building on the, the character and appearance of the area, and they found that because of the sort of slope of the land uh, and because of its appropriate sizing, its fairly small scale uh, and use of materials, as well as the ability to add a condition to add some more landscaping to the site, that the building itself would have or has an acceptable impact on, on the landscape. So all in all, looking at both those main issues, they were satisfied that a case had been, been made. So they go on to planning commission with the conditions that are set out at the beginning of the, the paper. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mr. White. A small development, perhaps, but nevertheless quite an important one in terms of principle. Um, Mr. Watson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's item number seven. Uh, on the uh, on the report on the reasons given reason number seven uh, which seems to be quite interesting for us um, there is no policy requirement for the applicant uh, to demonstrate a horticultural business there's no obligation to establish that the scale or nature of the activity of the site would constitute a viable business nor does the site need to be operated as a recognised agricultural or horticultural enterprise in order to benefit from the building so this presumably means that the reasons for refusing it before were down to this idea about whether it was actually rel whether it was necessary for a business, and the inspectors basically <coughs> saying, well, that that actually isn't relevant. So anybody can come along now, any householder with a even quite a small garden, um, and would be able to sort of say, well, I've got a beehive and I'm doing this, that, and the other, and, and I'm not required to demonstrate any business aspect of this. Just simply, that this is it's based on the activity rather than the nature of the business. 
Um, and um, yeah, that's something that, that uh, it, yeah, that's quite interesting. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a bad a bad decision by the inspector. I don't think it's good actually, but it's, it, that's, that that probably will have ramifications over the uh, it's of consequence, yes. I mean, I think, yeah, the inspector is saying it's looking at the particular activity. You know, it doesn't need to be a business to be a horticultural activity. Uh, and on its merits, it's found that this one's okay. Um, I think, you know, in terms of ramifications, I think that it's something to be careful about, isn't it? You know, we need to look at the specifics of each case. But yes, this one, they were satisfied that the business, oh, sorry, the business, the activity in itself presented a sufficient need for a building. Um, and the important and they felt that building was acceptable within that context. Mrs Nicholson. Just to say this, on, on, on bearing in mind both the things that you've just said, Joe, um, I think that, that, that's actually right, really quite helpful in terms of, of clarity, that people who have gardens who need to have somewhere to put the things that they, whether or not they're running a business. And I, I think that, that's actually a very forward-looking and helpful thing, and bearing in mind particularly Joe's thing about the right building, the right thing. Good. Are there any more comments on the appeal decision, please? Yes, Mr. Holton. The only thing I was concerned about was um, item number two on, on the conditions says it should be completed with a pitch corrugated steel roof. But looking through the appeal, he describes it as a grey roof, a dark grey roof, but then he hasn't told them to put a a, a, a coloured roof back onto the onto the shed. So, if, if, if you were the appellant, how would you clad your roof in in shiny tin? Because that's what it appears to be. Chairman, I mean, if the application proposal is for a, a grey colour, that's what the permission is granted on. The condition doesn't say a different colour. It just clarifies it should be a corrugated metal roof. <coughs> uh, not at all. Um, it, what you mean to say is you have a concern for detail. Yes. Which is a different thing. Right. Um, is there anything else on this decision? No, thank you. In that case, we'll move on to item 6, development management. And the first is 6.1 WTPO 24 slash 01 proposed work to tree subject to a tree preservation order. Um, and this is in the car park at Blackmore Gate, Mr. White. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, uh, this application <coughs> comes before us because it's a, an authority owned application. The authority owns the trees. It, there's four um, mature, late mature beech trees here at Blackmore Gate. Two important trees, they've grown together, uh, so we treat them as one entity. They have, they've got some shortcomings, I guess, in terms of where they've got to, so to try and maintain longevity of the trees. The proposal is that the crown's reduced and they're sort of pulled into the size a little bit, so they are sort of uh, have a height of about three metres and a spread of about three metres. Um, sorry, that, the plan we can see there highlights the, the, the trees just above or next to the, the Blackmore Gate by the car park. That's a couple of photographs. Um, just to show you, say, the nature trees within the group, they have had some failing limbs. The proposal is to, to pull them back to ensure they last as, as long as possible and stay as a feature within that landscape. Uh, and as such, it's recommended that uh, consent be granted, Chairman. Thank you. Members, yes, Dr. Kelly. Chair, members may know this from the site inspection when we look at the, uh, the railway application. They are an important uh, group of trees and they're important to be properly managed, so I'd support the recommendation. Would you like to move it? I would move approval. Thank you, Chair. Is that seconded? Yeah. yeah, by Miss Stacey. Do you wish to speak? No. Does anybody wish to speak to this? Yes, Mrs. Smith. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. I notice there's quite a lot of birds nest in the in the existing height. Will that make a difference? Will that impact? And is there a time scale for this work to be done out of nesting season? I think, Chairman, the works would need to be done outside the nesting season, so any protection for the birds, nesting birds, remains. Okay. Right. If there's no other comment, may I see all those in favour? That's 
Yes, thank you. That's Parson Imcon. Thank you. And the second application is 6924017DC, proposed discharge of condition 3 of approved application here at Exmoor House. Mr. White. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, there's another application that comes before us because it's the authority's own application. It relates to details to be agreed under condition as opposed to you know, a grant of planning commission to look at specific details. Members will recall probably considering the parent application at July committee, which related to the, the changes which are happening downstairs around the reception area. And as part of that scheme, there was um, some advertisements going on the building. Condition the, the listed building consent was that we agree specific details for those adverts. These are details now before us. So it's it's four four signs, uh, um, a hanging sign above the, the main entrance door and a panel sign on the front, a slight change to the window detail on a side door, and then an interpretation panel on the end gable looking towards the public car park. Just in terms of detail, that's the, the sort of, um, hanging sign above the entrance. It's a metal sign, non-illuminated, um, and what it has is uh, a, a, a detail that can be pulled off and stuck back on. It's all magnetic, so that allows to change the detail on the sign depending on whether the National Park Centre is open or not. And then the panel signs, they're both similar in terms of their, their detail. It's a timber surround with a metal insert. Again, depending on the information that needs to be displayed, there are um, magnetic signs which can be replaced. And at the bottom of the slide here, you can see that the detail within the window there, which would need to be, to be updated, but just to point visiting members of the public where the entrance door is. The details have been considered by the historic buildings officer and it's all felt to be appropriate in terms of listed building and therefore I would recommend that we agree the details under the condition. Thank you, Chairman. Can I just ask, if they're magnetic and therefore presumably designed to be removed, particularly if they are at normal operating level, what's to stop any vandal coming along and just stripping it off? It's not a planning matter, is it? Well, if we're deciding what, whether or not it's an appropriate material to be there... <coughs> I would like to think that wouldn't happen, Chairman. I mean, I guess it might be one of those things we would have to review if it does. Um, they'd be good magnets, I think. Uh, Mr. Petrinos. Thank you, Chair. I mean, I just want to make... Clear, just for the benefit of any member of the public who might be watching the recording of this, that, the, that these two items are only on the agenda because they happen to be in the ownership of the National Park Authority, and it's therefore for transparency reasons. Um, but I'm, a quite, I'm quite keen that, that um, any application by the National Park shouldn't get a particularly easy ride from this just because of that. But I'm glad if I can think of anything further to, like, to say about this. <laughs> So, I mean, unless anybody's got anything to say, I'm happy to move the recommendation. I think they might have, Mr. Petrinos, oh, but you can still move it, that's fine. So, Mr. Petrinos has moved. Does I anyone wish to second it? Dr. Kelly will second it. Do you wish to speak, Dr. Kelly? No, nothing to say. But Mrs. Nicholson would like to speak. Mrs. Nicholson would like to speak. I, I know that this is the details matter, and the decision was made earlier in the year that this was appropriate. <coughs> I just want to record here that I absolutely object to a pub sign over the front door of a very splendid building. And that's what it looks like to me. And I, I thought it was the wrong decision then, I think it's the wrong decision now, so I will abstain because there's no point in voting against the thing wrong with the details of what's happening. It's just the wrong thing to be doing. We hear what you say, Mrs. Nicholson. Mrs. Smith. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if it would have been an opportunity to have put a QR code in with this that someone could have scanned to have got a lot more information out of this rather than just that, I can't even read it from back here, that information. I yeah. don't know whether that is relevant to, to planning, but I think it might have been a lost opportunity with the opportunity to give a fair bit of information about Exmoor. Yes, Mr James, who is spearheading the application, is sitting uh, in the public gallery and I'm sure will be listening to exactly what you're saying. So whilst I don't think it's anything that we can deal with uh, as part of the planning, nevertheless I'm sure he is hearing what you're saying. 
Right. Any other member wish to comment, please? Yes, Mrs. Lawrence. It's a very good point, so thank you. Mr. Holton. Is there an opportunity to review the colour green on the door, which rather jars with the green of the signage? We are stepping outside the scope of what we're dealing with in front of us, Chairman, yes, but I mean, it's something that can be raised subsequently and dealt with anyway. And I suspect that might be something more to do with the colour values of the photograph mm -hmm. rather than um, the actuality, but uh, again, I'm sure Mr James will be hearing what you're saying. Right, um, are there any other relevant points that any member wishes to make? <laughs> If not, it has been moved and seconded that we approve. May I see all those in favour, please? Any against? One abstention? Yes, thank you very much. So that stands approved. Now, um, we do have a couple of quite interesting uh, items now to work our way through. The first is our usual applications uh, delegated to the Chief Executive, item 7. Um, and again, we'll go through these page by page. There are a number of very interesting ones here that I think we might want to reflect on. Uh, so, page one. Anybody want to raise anything there? <coughs> page two. So, as usual, um, the second one down, uh, complete one down, 610-24008, which was refused at High Street Dunster. Mm -hmm. High Street Dunster, sorry, Chairman. Um, Gravis House, that's yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, sorry, West Street. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's one that, it's, it's amend an amendment to uh, an already granted scheme. Um, it changed primarily the roof design. Uh, it, the changes we felt raised concerns in terms of design uh, such that actually we couldn't support the scheme. So that has been refused. Um, they still have the, the planning commission as, as originally granted and they have the right to appeal against the subsequent refusal. So we shall see which option they wish to pursue. Okay. Anything else on page two? <coughs> page 3 and we do on page 3 have the refusal of the application at the Georgian Rockton Regis yeah thanks chairman this was a scheme that had significant local interest um, the proposal would result in the loss of the public house uh, and the evidence to demonstrate the public house um, couldn't be considered viable or made viable was insufficient such that um, we felt that it didn't, didn't satisfy the, the, the policy requirements and the local plan which seek to safeguard such uses um, and the plan commission has been refused on that basis. Again, it's one which we will see in terms of how that plays out. There, is, there are further discussions happening uh, with, with, with the agent around that refusal and they obviously have the right to appeal as well. So we'll see where that one ends up. Members will be aware that this is one that had a lot of local publicity um, and um, uh, a large public meeting uh, about it. But um, the park's um, uh, planning policy has been applied perfectly rigorously on this. Dr Kelly? Yes, Chair, I, I don't know the, the property. Is it operating as a public house at the moment, can I ask? It closed recently. Chairman, mm -hmm. so it's not currently operating. One could say more, but yeah. better not. Right. <coughs> Good. Anything else on page three? Page four. Could we just 
I wonder, there, there are two at the top of page four. The first, uh, which was refused, and then the second one at Hunter's Moon X Ward, which was approved, because that was quite an interesting point of principle. Um, but yes, uh, Marshwood, Exton, Dalberton? Yes, so there were a refused um, application there, Chairman. It was a stuff of a lawfulness for an existing development. Uh, this was a case where a planning commission was granted historically for a, a rural worker dwelling, which was built. Um, the case has subsequently been made through actually two separate applications, but the case has been made that the building as built didn't comply with the planning commission granted, such that if that were the case, the conditions which limit the occupancy of the dwelling would no longer bite, i.e. they built something without planning permission, they didn't use a planning permission which says it has to be a rural worker dwelling, I've just built something different. If that's proven, you end up with different lawfulness and then you have an unrestricted dwelling essentially. Um, so this is the second of uh, two applications, two separate lawful applications, which sought to argue that the changes in the built development were so different from what was granted planning permission the planning commission didn't bite. We were unconvinced in this case. We don't think that the built development is so far different from what's granted planning permission that it's no longer governed by that planning commission. So what we're saying here is that no, there are some changes mm -hmm. in terms of the fenestration, but the building that's there is sufficiently close to what's granted planning permission to mean that permission bites. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it is subject to the oxy condition. Okay. There is the right to appeal against that as well. Um, you know, there are cases. I don't think there's anything. In, oh, there is. There's a one subsequently on this list actually, where a similar case was made, and we felt the differences in that case were such that a different building has been built. Largely, in that case, it was in the different. It was outside the red line area, so it was outside the application site, um, and that was related to a really old planning commission. So, one later on, we were convinced by the arguments. We weren't in this case. Thank you, Chairman. On that point, if that were to happen today and a building was being built and had planning permission, would that not would it not be obvious when the building regs checks are being done that it was actually deviating from the plan drawings? And is there any relationship that we can call on between us and the building regs people to ensure that that gets flagged up early? So, Chairman, it's not foolproof by any means. You know, we do what we can. Uh, we do actually check the building regs notifications, but there isn't. I mean, building regs won't look at the planning commission. They look at the plans in front of us. And um, you know, we obviously try and monitor where we can. It's it's we use a lot more than what we do now, simply be, you know, in terms of resources. But we do do what we can to pick these things up. Um, as I say, in this case, I think if we went to look at it during the process, we probably would have said it's it's okay. Hence. Why we refuse a certificate because it's not, it's yeah. not, it's not so far from the approved scheme. I have an experience of having to lower the roof of the Wimbledon cafe and toilet block by three inches because that was spotted. <laughs> <laughs> we understand your private grief. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, anything else on that? Okay. Um, the one below was, uh, I thought, quite interesting because the applicant, quite innocently, I think, had uh, replaced his septic tank next to the old one and con had connected up using the existing pipework. But unfortunately, it was in the field outside of his immediate domestic curtilage. Mm. Uh, and so, therefore, it required planning permission. Am I right? Correct, Chairman. Good. It was an engine operation. Um, we don't sit here and try and defend the planning system. You know, it, is, it is what it is. And, it well, is and, and indeed, it was approved with yeah. conditions, yeah. and uh, that does, did seem to be perfectly reasonable. But it was an interesting case, I thought, where you, you, an assumption you might naturally make about a re, even a replacement uh, septic tank can't always um, uh, be taken for granted. So that was interesting. Uh, worth noting, I think. Mr. Yes, yeah, so just, just for people listening, just so I, this is clear, I'm not sure I've understood it. So, if you're replacing a septic tank within the curtilage, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sort of, could you, could, from what I understood again, and, and if I'm being slow here, you seem to imply that the problem was it was outside the curtilage, and therefore 
therefore was a development, effectively like a new development that required permission. But if you were just simply had a, a septic tank, because of course their, their active life is what, 20 years or something, we must have these happening all the time. So if you've got one that has failed and needs replacing, but is simply within where it, you know, the curtilage of the building where it was, then do we expect an application to come in every time for one of those? Because presumably we'd, we'd be getting a lot of those coming through. Potentially. I mean, it's, it's a really different. I mean, it, it's, it's all context driven. I mean, it, in, in essence, we step back and say, well, you know, we come back to definition development. Uh, in, in this case, it's an engine operation. Now, sometimes within your domestic curtilage, you, you can look at permitted development rights. You might well be able to do it permitted development. Mm -hmm. I think for people listening, the safest thing to do is ask first, mm -hmm. uh, and then we, you know, we can we can give advice. But again, to be clear, what we're not saying ask first. We're saying pay sixty pounds for pre-application advice. Well, that is the way you ask. No, I'm just, again, I'm just yes. clarifying. Yes. But, yeah, yes. so that, exactly the way, but that is, yes. that, again, that's a change, it's a recent yes. change. Yes. So again, we need to be clear yes. that at the moment we don't have clear, basically what we're saying is we do not currently have clear guidance on this issue. You would need to pay for pre-application advice. That's, that's what we're saying. Um, yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't have to apply or seek In advice. The you, of but it's safest to. Um, it's really difficult to be specific you know, when there's nothing specific in front of us. I mean, there's lots of grey areas in planning, okay, it, but you come back to the basic principles of what is development. Development covers very minor things, doesn't it? Um, so the safest thing, if in doubt, is, is to ask that question. I mean, you know, you might approach us in the first instance just to have asked that question verbally. It might, but we can't easily deal with that. It might then result in a look, follow the pre-application inquiry route, we can deal with it. If it's only pretty straightforward, Dominic, I think we'd be happy to say, you know, you're not getting anything in writing either, are you? That's the other. So sure. pre-advice pre advice might be. Understood, understood. Yeah. <coughs> Mrs Nicholson. Just a little development of the same thought as to what's the curtilage or not. Is it the same sort of curtilage that we think of in terms of the listed building? Because I remember a listed building curtilage in... Um, uh, somewhere near Linton that stretched for about half a mile? Yeah. This is going to drill into a really difficult territory for me in a minute, Chairman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting material for us to discuss. Mm. Yeah. It is. Because it's really hard to be precise because yeah. it's, you know, we're not talking about anything specific in front of us. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in this case, I think it was fairly obvious that there was nothing specific in front of us. I mean, in this case, I think it was fairly obvious where the extent of the garden was yeah. and what was our cultural land. So. Yeah, um, there was a difference. Fortunately, that was kicked up. I was just throwing it. Dr. Kelly. I'm not going to weigh in. I'm sorry. Um, right. In terms of my understanding, this particular application, you, you, I think you mentioned, was outside the red line, and therefore, if it did benefit from pl any planning permission, or indeed any permitted development rights, because it was outside the red line, it would not. And any development, development is defined as any operation in, on, or under the, la the land. So technically, as Mr. White has said, yes, it requires permission. But it may be a permitted development, depending on the particular circumstances. That's why it's very difficult to give a general answer. In terms of the second issue, which is, what is curtilage? Well, curtilage is a medieval Scottish <laughs> term, in my understanding, which is very difficult to define, <laughs> probably because of that very reason. And again, it's got to be looked at on its individual merits. But in terms of a listed building, if it's affecting the setting of a listed building, and again, that's each on its own merits, that may well be different, and may, may well be larger than curtilage. So that's why it's extremely difficult to give a simple answer to what appear to be quite simple questions. Is that sufficient for now? Never let it be said that being a member of the planning committee is not an education in itself. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, moving on to page five. Um, do you wish to draw our attention to anything, Mr. White? I mean, I will raise one because I think it's, it's of relevance. Uh, well, I, I, I think Mr. Gray was about to as well, so I'm wrong. The Colburn, yeah, so there's the second one down, the proper, set, the sec, the proper second one down in the list. So this is another proposal for the change of use of a public house, but in this instance, actually, planning permission has been granted. So similar to the certificate here, 
that I talked about a minute ago, we've got you know, two decisions which on the face of them relate to, to similar issues. So with this case, we're grasping the similar issues as we were with the George. Um, but in this case, we felt able to grant a planning permission. Um, in terms of the specific context around this one, uh, an economic viability report was prepared and submitted with the application. The site has a history of failed operations in terms of uh, its, its functioning as a public house. It's very remote, uh, it's set well outside of a settlement. And I think the, the, the particular circumstance in this case meant that we were able to go on a planning commission. Interestingly, what the applicant was asking for was not necessarily to lose the pub completely, but to expand its use, the ability to have use. Now, the reality is, in reality, you could lose the pub completely because it may, in terms of its expanded use, they may step out of the public house use and that, you know, they don't, they're not required to bring that back. But there's no physical change to the building within the planning permission, so you wouldn't lose that functional space to have as a public house. Uh, there's nothing in there to stop it coming back as a public house in the future as well. So there is that element as well which I think helps the scheme, but in terms of the evidence behind it, it was more robust here. I say it has a history of failed operations and its remoteness is also mm -hmm. something that's quite significantly different from yeah. the case before it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that clarification. It was the mixed use I see make a difference. The failed use as a public house, I obviously haven't seen the details, but I know the people used to run it. Um, and I wasn't sure unless it was a financial failure and they walked away from it. And of course the applicant for a while ran this as a public house and I'd be eaten there. Um, I didn't care for what it said, but my understanding was they chose not to carry on using it that way. But I think the reassuring thing is it can be a public house going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and if someone to, were to buy this, they have two choices. I see one uses a private venue, always public house, am I right? And not necessarily a shooting lodge, it's a, a private venue for other, other things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Again, helpful for us to know, yes. I think. Dr. Kelly. <coughs> One detail, sorry, Chair. Is this a property where we had an issue with, dare I say it, UPVC windows? Mm -hmm. And could I ask what the present position is regarding that? It remains an issue, Chairman, and it's something we are pursuing. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just so I can be clear with what Mr. White said, um, you said that it retains the features of the public house internally and therefore could revert to being a public house. But is there any planning controls on stopping someone changing the internal features of their property? Chairman, no. The answer is no. It, it actually, they could, they could make internal changes, yes. Okay, uh, anything else on page five? Um, this is Nicholson. I would be grateful for clarity on final disposed of because I'm, I'm not as clear on that as I ought to be. Oh, at um, Hedden Hall. Two of them. Two of them. Two, yeah. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. There. So, um, the ability to sort of finally dispose of applications is a tool available to local planning authorities. And it's, it's not, it's exercised. Um, Rarely, I think it's fair to say, although it's something we have utilised more regularly recently as, been, as we've been working through the backlog of planning applications. But it's in those cases where you're looking at particularly historic applications where, as a local planning authority, we've thought to move it forward, but we're not getting the engagement from the applicant. Um, so it, we don't just move to dispose of it. We give them notice in the first instance, give them the opportunity to move the application forward with time scale set. And after that period, we're actually then able to, to move to find dispose the application. And in the case of both of these, that's what's happened here. Head and Hall, interestingly, what happened was actually it's now under new ownership and we've got an application back in to deal with this from the new owners. So we expect that to, to, to be sorted. Um, the one at Newland Farm, that was slightly complicated because it relates to a conversion of a building as well. So it's probably the wrong application type. Um, but nonetheless, it's not one that we've been able to move forward with the applicant. Um, if they were willing, minded to in the future, obviously it's something we can work through. I think as a matter of principle, we could support something there. Again, the detail probably needs to be, be looked at and, and worked through. Okay. Uh, page six. Page 
page 7. Page 8. Yes, so about halfway down um, with Lake Farm. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so this is a case where some UPC windows have been put in the list of building without consent. Uh, we've had discussions. That did result in this application, but the application wasn't what we were anticipating. It's been refused, I think, probably for understandable reasons. Um, but discussions are continuing. What we think, what we expect to happen is the applicant will submit a fresh application to put timber windows in and we'll agree a time scale for that to happen. So I think it's one that is resolvable. It's just working through it. It needs a, a, a separate application which will deal with actually putting timber in and then we'll, we'll, we'll allow a reasonable time scale for that, for that to happen. Okay. And then the last one on page, the only one on page nine. <laughs> page nine. No, no. I was just going to mention actually the bottom of page eight, just to highlight it. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's a long-standing planning application. Uh, took a while to get there, but um, actually with some contact recently from the applicant, um, they've been very proactive in sorting out. We've got the planned mission through for a local need affordable dwelling, which is really good to see. Which has been in occupation for some time. Which is why it's quite good that we managed to sort <laughs> out quite quickly. Uh, yes, on page nine. Sorry, yes. Page nine, Chairman. So this is, again, it's another long-standing planning application. It ends up being withdrawn. Um, the reason why it's so long-standing is there's issues there with, with flood risk. Um, and the applicant had been trying to work through those um, over a number of years. Uh, we got to where we got to and it just wasn't happening, so they withdrew the application and that's, I think, probably the end of that site, Chairman. Mr. Sorry, I wasn't quick. Can, can I go back to the Woodlake uh, one? Mm -hmm. Whether it's a planning issue, I'm not sure. Are there any existing new PPC windows which are in there, and, or are they all the existing ones that are wood? And then they put UPVC in. So yeah, all the existing windows which were replaced were timber ones. They weren't historic fabric, but they were timber windows that were replaced. Okay, thanks. Was that the question you were asking? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah that's you were asking were there any other UPVC windows? Sorry, I was asking that as well. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Chairman. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's no other. Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. I mean, I know one sentence is making difference, yeah. but uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, that was very helpful, and I do think it is important for us as members to understand the delegated decisions list, and it was a fairly hefty li list this month, because of course we didn't have it to consider last month. But thank you very much, Mr. White, for that. Now, uh, the other thing that we do need to uh, look at and note is the sh schedule of Section 106 agreements, because we are all, I'm sure, asked quite regularly, what has happened to this application or the other application? Oh, well, it's been subject to its 106 agreement being worked through. So this is a list of the 106 agreements that have been concluded and are in the course of being concluded, one of which, uh, on the first page, has actually, I understand, been settled um, anyway. So do you want to run us down through the list, Mr. White? Yeah, thanks, Chairman. I mean, I'm happy to go into more detail if and when as we're going through, but uh, the top one, Lower Cleef Barnes, uh, that's one that discussions continue, um, <coughs> principally in relation to the definition of uh, affordable rent, uh, and there's sort of some backwards and forwards with, the, with us, the applicant, and, and our lawyers, um, but that continues. Sanctuary Lane, uh, actually this week there's been some more movement on that. You can see the draft has been sent over, um, but uh, certainly this week, yesterday and today, discussions are, are, are taking place around that and some of the definitions within the legal agreement as well. So we'll see how that progresses. Thorn Farm, um, so the, the draft is, is there. Uh, this is a similar type proposal, I guess, as, as to Lower Cleave. So in terms of that definition around affordable rent, there's some link between the two there. So they're sort of tied up 
together in terms of uh, moving those forward. Land west of Harricombe Lane, um, you know, that's one <laughs> that's one that's been, been on, ongoing for some while. We can see on there that draft was sent over um, towards the end of July. Discussions around that certainly over the last three or four weeks have, have been frequent. Um, it, it's, it's a matter actually to the, the local housing authorities now like to be part of the agreement as well in terms of how that's managed, uh, which is actually really positive. And I, I thought we were there before actually on this one, but we're, I think we're, we're much closer to seeing that one concluded, which is really good um, to see that one come forward. Land at Spark Hayes Lane. Uh, the section 106 there is held in abeyance at the minute because there's some other matters in terms of the planning considerations that need to be resolved. So we're looking to work through those before any progress, further progress is made on section 106 because that potentially is abortive work. So we're just holding on to that one at the minute. Lower Glebe House, you'll see from the list there that um, the instruction went over in, in March this year, but there's been very little progress since, partly because we're not getting much back from the applicant. So that's one that we need to sort of chase and see where we are. It might be, again, this could be a situation where the application is finally disposed of or refused, um, but it's, it's one that we need to keep as officers put the pressure on. Uh, ben Twitch and House, uh, there's been some discussions around that one recently as well. The draft is with the applicant. Um, an updated plan for the agreement was sent over yesterday, and our lawyer also chased the draft yesterday. So. We'll see where that one goes uh, over the next few days. Um, the long garden plot, Ash Lane, that's the one that actually just before I came in to this meeting I was able to sign off, which is really good news. Yes, that, that's finally been sorted to so that. Permission has, has gone. Um, Could you just say, maybe, yes. if you feel able, why that... Um, the application, what the application... Yes. For, yeah, so... Um, this site has already got planning permission for locally affordable dwelling. Um, what the, the, this currently re relates to is an amendment of that planning permission. There's a condition on the planning permission that says that they should have timber windows, as typically we expect to see. Mm -hmm. They've applied to, to amend that. I'll come on to the reasons why, but actually as officers we, we feel able to support it in this case. That then means it's a fresh grant of planning permission, so we need to pull section 106 agreement through, hence the need for the variation. That's, if you like, taken some time to work through we've got there. But importantly, it's probably important to, to stress it, obviously, typically, we resist EBVC windows, certainly in, in new builds, but there is some flex within the preamble to the policy in the local plan, and that set out, sets out circumstances where we think we can. This site has a particular set of circumstances arriving around the context of the site, which I think we feel we can exercise that flex to reach this position. Largely, it's within the context of post-war development, modern development, okay? There's, coming up to the site, you're dealing with bungalows, former council housing, a predominance of UPVC windows. That's, that's the context you're dealing with. Opposite, it's, it's a, an 80s building as well, UPVC and above. UPVC, so, it's very much a case of look. That's that's the material. So it's not harmful to introduce or to, to continue to use that material. And importantly, in terms of the design of this house, it's I think it's a, an unusual design. It's an attractive design. Um, but the windows themselves are fairly plain. You know, so they're you know they're not as detailed as the windows you might see here. They're panes of glass with a frame, and the windows they're proposing would be flush fitting. They won't have external trickle vents, they won't have external um, hinges, so they'll look like the timber windows which have been granted. So in that context, it's very specific to this site, it, but it's one where we think we can flex. So it, I think the flex has been used to good use in this case, and it's got a positive outcome. Which is not uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is actually really good to hear and, and to hear the reasoning behind it. Um, if we have time, could I beg your indulgence for two minutes on another thing to do with that particular site? It, it's not a it's just information not particularly planning. Well, we two have minutes? two minutes, and I suppose under the circumstances we might allow a very slight. Right. Uh, just that the, in this was a self-built affordable local needs mm -hmm. um, and needed support in many ways. To, to help them get there. Uh, it was used as a test project 
for highways to use their new powers to require utility companies to work together to both, uh, so that there were not repeated applications for road closures at vast cost each time. This particular bit of work, has, um, which was done by a chap called Luke Green at, at, at Somerset, um, it, is in, he did the work. The reason he, that he was allowed the time to do it um, was to um, produce a template for other similar circumstances across the county. So this is something that's come out of Exmoor. Um, for everybody else's is, 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 is benefit. And as far as the officer was concerned, he said it was the best piece of work he'd done, uh, most satisfying piece of work he'd done in some years because he could see the end customer, the end person. Um, thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. And as you say, this, this particular application, which is why it is worth drawing attention to it, <coughs> it's one that the, um, the uh, Exmoor Young Voices and the park have been using um, as a bit of a test case to bring forward um, a sub-build um, in a, in, in a Exmoor Village context. And um, there are issues to be worked through, but as Mr White has said, you know, the park has been very flexible in working them through. Mr Bray. So Stephen, as you know, I know when to um, Is this the property, of, as you got back, Ash Lane, past the existing canteras on the left-hand side, sort of half-built? Yeah. Okay. That was self-build, probably, yes. hence what you're saying. Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you for that. Um, and the last one at the bottom of the page? No? Yeah, that, that's, um, again, this is another deed of variation. Uh, the deed of variation in this case is needed not to try and pull forward a previous Section 106 agreement. It's to stop the original planning commission being built out. So this here is uh, an old farm. Some members may remember... Um, and I can't remember the date off the top of my head now, but some years ago, a uh, planning commission was granted for a rural worker dwelling uh, with uh, a double garage next door to it along Knoll Lane. Uh, the, the building, and we knew at the time, the building was going to be put over built up ground, um, which there were some conditions around contamination, which has all been worked through, technical start made on the planning commission, uh, and then and that related to the, the, the garage itself. The attached dwelling, when, whilst we were looking at work to do that, it was discovered that actually to get a sure footing in, because it was on made up ground, required quite a lot of concrete, mm. quite an expense. Uh, so they revisited that and decided actually it would be better from their point of view if they put it on a different footprint, different sizing, but within the application red line area. So they applied to make a, an amendment to the existing planning commission. We're satisfied with that. It does push it further back into the site, but in terms of the character appearance of the area, that's absolutely fine. Um, but what we don't want to do in granting planning permission is inadvertently give them planning permission for two houses. Mm. And the only way we can stop that, because they don't, the two sites don't correlate, is through a legal agreement. So that, that's what the agreement would be, is to say they do one or the other. Um, so that's just something to work through. So, okay, is this opposite no lane opposite from the farm, where they built the land up and there was concern about contaminating material? That's correct. So they're still going to have to dig down, but elsewhere. Where they, where they moved to, actually, the, the ground hasn't been built up, so it just goes a bit further back into the site, and that's, it's, un, it's not, that's not ground that's been made up there. So, uh, okay, makes sense. Okay. Right, and then on the next page, you have the 106 agreements resolved since the 1st of February. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just really included, just to see that, you know, obviously, the, the stuff that's gone on there, um, I think it's it's a fairly healthy list in terms of what's being delivered to, in terms of locally affordable dwellings, um, and it's quite nice to be able to keep adding to that. So I, I hope members found that useful, but I think it is important for us to be aware of one, where the 106s are, because uh, I, I'm often asked, well, you know, you granted planning permission for this, why has it not happened? Well, because we're waiting for the 106 agreements, and sometimes there are very significant issues that have got to be worked through. But, um, so we can note that report and thank you very much Mr White for bringing it to us and explaining it so thoroughly I think that was really helpful so item 9 site visit, should there be the need to have any the reserve date is the 29th of November Friday the 29th I am not aware of any other business of urgency 
So accordingly, ladies and gentlemen, I will bring this meeting to a close and we will prepare for our next at half past two. Thank you.